and really want to jump right in. We're expecting the Deputy Ambassador from Kenya to also join us, so when she does, we'll certainly incorporate her in the program. Uh, just a quick introduction of Ambassador Grant. Since 2009, he has served as the permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the United Nations, where he plays an active role as head of delegation. He's got a very impressive and auspicious career, uh, having served in Namibia, in the Southern Africa Department, as well as in a number of other posts. I won't go through the entire bio, but um, I just want to give you a very, very quick sense of what we discussed yesterday and some of our goals while we're here. Um, this is a group of about 30 leaders from across the World Vision Partnership. We've got representatives from some of our regional offices, our national offices. We've got two extremely dynamic young people from Brazil and Armenia who had a chance to share some of their inspirational work yesterday. Yesterday we heard from some senior UN officials about the process around the post Millennium Development Goal framework and had a chance to discuss what some of our priorities are going into this process. And we're really here to try to figure out how World Vision can best engage in this process and try to particularly prioritize the participation of young people as change agents within it, of children and young people, and to ensure that whatever is realized in terms of an enhanced or post Millennium Development Goal framework really puts a premium on improving the lives of the most vulnerable. Um, we think the issues of equity are crucial and it's been one of the challenges of the current framework. So with that just very quick intro, one of the questions that came up yesterday that we still have a little bit of lack of clarity around is the relationship between the sustainable development goals and the post million development goal framework. And if you could shed some light on that, that'd be great. And then just would love to hear your perspective about the overall framework itself and what the UK government is doing and, and hopes to achieve. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Appreciate uh, that uh, introduction and it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'll just make a few sort of introductory remarks and then we can have a, a question and an answer session. And I apologize for the sort of time constraints, but the Security Council is now meeting at, uh, at 10 o'clock on uh, Unimid, which is the Darfur uh, peacekeeping operation, and we're in charge of that in, in, in the Security Council, so I must be there for the, for the vote. Um, uh, perhaps just by way of preliminary, I could say that uh, the UK government and World Vision has a very close uh, relationship. We've done quite a lot of funding, particularly for your work in the MDGs area. I think $15 million uh, was the most uh, recent pledge over the last three years. And so we really value the work that you do, particularly around the current MDGs uh, 4 and 5 on newborn uh, child maternal health in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and Asia, um, which have been absolutely critical priorities for DFID uh, and the British government. Now, the reason that I'm sitting here largely is because my Prime Minister, David Cameron, has been asked by the Secretary General to be one of the co-chairs of his high-level panel in on the post-2015 uh, framework, um, along with the presidents of Liberia uh, and Indonesia. And he's been chosen, I think, because, well, I know, because A, he is very passionate about this agenda, and B, because the United Kingdom has a very strong record on development aid, and we're the only G8 country now that is going to meet the target of 0.7% GDP spent on, on overseas development. And the development budget is only one of two budgets that have been protected in the British government's budget, health and overseas aid, uh, because David Cameron has been very clear that he doesn't want the economic recovery in the UK to be on the backs of poor people uh, worldwide. Now, that is a highly controversial position, particularly for a conservative government to take, and he's been heavily criticized by it from the right uh, in the UK, as you can imagine when there are cuts going on in every other sector of uh, the public sector. Uh, you know, my pay has been frozen, my pension's been cut, for instance. So, you know, all public servants are suffering, but he is very committed to maintaining that. And I think Ban Ki-moon recognized that, and that's one of the reasons that he was chosen uh, to be a co-chair. Now, this panel will be announced uh, at 3.30 this afternoon. Uh, the full composition of the panel, uh, it's gonna have 26 people, 
uh, plus Amina Mohammed, who is the uh, Assistant Secretary General, will be a sort of ex officio member. So it's actually a slightly larger panel than, than we had in mind, but it's got a very good spread of uh, gender. I mean, in fact, it's got more women than men on it and in the full uh, outcome now. Um, there are good balance between those in government and those not in government, between those who are in the public sector and the private sector, uh, between young people and older people, uh, and obviously geographical regional balance. So he's had to uh, mix these things up, as the UN always has to do, and that's one of the reasons we've ended up with 26, whereas we would have preferred something between 15 and 20, to be honest, because it's just more manageable just getting everyone in the same room. Uh, apart from uh, anything else. Um, now, five points that I want to make uh, about this task. Um, we are very ambitious about it, but within the framework of, of five points. One is that we mustn't lose focus on the existing MDGs. We've still got more than three years to go before the post 2015 MDGs will be launched because that'll be in September 2015. So there's three and a bit years to go still of the current MDGs. And although a lot of good progress has been made, a lot has not been made. Um, they're very powerful. They have proved to be a sort of rallying cry both for developing countries and uh, for developed uh, countries, uh, despite the opposition that they got when they first came out in 2000 from some quarters. Uh, and we need to maintain the pressure on that. Um, and that's why we had a, a family planning summit in London uh, just last month with the Gates Foundation that we will be hosting an event in, in the high level uh, segment of the UNGA in September here on the sort of countdown to the MDGs just so that people don't lose sight in the excitement of thinking about what comes after 2015 that there's still three years to go to 2015. Second point is that therefore uh, in our view, the post-2015 framework needs to build on the success of the current uh, MDGs. And there have been some global successes in maternal and child health, clean water, nutrition, uh, and food security. Uh, and those are areas where still work to be done, and the MDGs were right to include them. But the third point is that the MDG framework was not perfect. Uh, it made various assumptions about the preconditions for poverty alleviation. And in our view, the post-2015 framework should set a bold, transformative agenda, which helps to put in place, in particular, the necessary enablers for poverty eradication, such as security, growth, jobs, access to justice, and the rule of law, which were not really covered by the 2000 uh, MDGs. Secondly, the world has changed a hell of a lot since 2000. Um, and there are new challenges and new dimensions to poverty that need to be considered uh, in the new framework. Um, we've learned a lot about, for instance, that 65% of the countries not meeting the current MDGs uh, are in conflict or related to conflict areas. We need to tackle that issue. So we need to think about how these new dimensions are covered in the post-2015 framework. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that goals and frameworks help to synthesize the agenda, mobilize, but not all problems have a goal-shaped solution, is the way we put it. That you cannot put everything into a simple goal in the development agenda. Uh, and we need to remember that it all comes down to national plans and implementations. It can't all be captured uh, in a single global goal. And the last point I want to make is that we want the panel to generate a clear vision of what we want and to begin to structure how we get there. We need to attain, despite what I said about the goal-shaped problems, the solutions, we have to maintain the crispness and the clarity and the rallying branding, if you like, of the MDGs. Uh, because if we don't, they won't have that power. If we end up with a 220-page report, uh, 
it may be as worthy as you like, but no one's going to read it. Certainly no heads of government are going to read it. Uh, and that would be a shame. So you no doubt will have to have a 220-page report, but it's got to be, on top of it, there's got to be a one-page piece of paper that can give that sort of clarity and, and branding uh, to the work. Now, what does that mean for the process? Uh, the <laughs> I'd be interested to know what the UN system thinks of the process, but the process is a mess, uh, as always, uh, at the UN, um, because there is quite a lot of tension between uh, the intergovernmental process, the interstate process, and the non-interstate process, if you like. And what happened is that at Rio, a new intergovernmental process was set up on the SDGs, uh, partly because that was justified in terms of what Rio outcome reached or didn't reach, but also partly as a reaction to Ban's announcement of the high-level panel on the MDGs, which is not an intergovernmental process. So we have two slightly overlapping processes uh, slightly competing processes, but that we need to make complementary. They don't need to be conflictual. Uh, they can be complementary, but that's going to be quite a challenge. Because one of the big differences between now and 2000 is that although there was a lot of preparatory work done in various uh, conferences in the run-up to 2000, the reality is that the MDGs emerged as a top-down, back-of-an-envelope process with about three people involved. Um, and it was plonked down there and adopted without much discussion. Here, we have a three-year preparatory process where uh, everyone is going to be involved. There's going to be much more preparation, consultation, outreach than there's ever been before. And that is excellent in terms of the richness of the inputs and uh, the thoroughness of the preparation. It's not so good in trying to distill it down into a single piece of paper at the end of it. And how can you do that? You certainly can't do that through an intergovernmental process, as any number of uh, recent examples um, shows. Now, this means that the sequencing and the timing is going to be very important. Uh, the high-level panel has been asked to report by June next year. So it will run from a first meeting, which will be held in, uh, on the 25th of September, up until June next year. And it will produce a report and a vision, and maybe even a one-page document, as well as the report, in June next year to the Secretary General. The Secretary General will then produce a report for September next year, and then there will be an intergovernmental process for a couple of years. But in the meantime, you have the open working group post-Rio, which is going to start work at some point this year, uh, although the very process of agreeing who's going to be on it will take several months, I expect. So uh, our expectation, and indeed hope, is that it won't really start its work until after the panel has finished its work. Uh, so it will run for another year at least until uh, September 2014. And then you will have a final intergovernmental process, which is essential in the run-up to what will probably be another summit in September 2015. And it will be that summit that will be the sort of culmination of the 20 to 20, 2015 and the start of the post-2015. Uh, now, that leaves, obviously, a lot of uh, uncertainties. Um, and we must avoid any polarization between the MDG work and the SDG work. But you've seen, for those of you who are involved in Rio, uh, that tension is really there between those who are favoring an environmental, sustainable approach and those who are favoring a poverty-based approach. In our view, of course, the two should be complementary and can be made complementary. And if that means you get rid of the MDGs and you get rid of the SDGs and you have some GDGs, you know, Global Development Goals or whatever, which embraces both the SDGs and the MDGs, then uh, that may be the way forward. But in our view, it needs to bring the streams together. And certainly, the high-level panel will be looking to find a vision which will bring those uh, streams um, together. Finally, uh, as I mentioned, this process is going to be much more interactive uh, and widespread than any previous process. And the outreach is going to be vitally important. And one of the things that has changed since 2000 is the ability to reach 
people who can input into that debate, which could, who couldn't be reached before, through uh, text messaging and Twitter and social media of different sorts. Uh, David Cameron is very keen to not only allow the great and the good and the big NGOs to input, but also ordinary communities and ordinary people in poor countries and ordinary <coughs> poor people potentially have that access in, in places like Africa they never had before in order to input into the uh, panel's work. Of course, we'll have to do a lot of outreach of the traditional kind with member states here in New York and regional groupings around the world, etc. But mobile phone usage and texting, all this sort of thing is now an opportunity to have a wider series of inputs. But again, I go back to the fact that then increases the challenge and the difficulty of ending up with a single a four sheet of paper that has the power that the MDGs uh, currently have. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great overview. And I want to kind of quickly get to my colleagues' questions. I'm going to just ask a bridge question, though, following up on the last thing you talked about. We know that the UK government's going to be hosting the G8 next year. And I'm wondering whether you see an opportunity for some discussion to be had at that summit to try to reinforce and deepen kind of engagement and commitment by G8 leaders around this post-development, millennial development goal process and framework. And then even beyond that, kind of looking at the G20 as another critical body. So just give us your thoughts about the opportunities there. Yes, uh, the G8 presidency runs from January to December and we'll be taking over therefore in January with a summit in normally in July which will be immediately after the panel has, has produced its its work um, but we certainly plan to use the G8 to mobilize uh, G8 countries on this agenda now uh, as I said at the beginning we are the only G8 country whose development assistance is going in the right direction uh, let alone meet the 0.7% uh, target next year so it is a challenge in the current financial climate to mobilize those commitments that have already been made. Um, in fact, the commitments were first made in the last <laughs> G8 summit, which was in Glen Eagles, uh, in Scotland, however, eight years ago, I guess. Um, uh, if there were eight countries in the G8 in those days, maybe seven, so maybe seven years ago. Uh, but that was one where commitments were made on development, and those commitments have not been met. And of course, there are many developing countries who say, well, it's all about the developed countries meeting their commitments. Now, of course, that is an important element, and we mustn't lose sight of that, and we will do our best to mobilize colleagues to do that but it ignores the fact that there are these emerging powers who are not pulling their weight at all on the developing areas, and it ignores the fact that there has to be mutual accountability and that you know, the countries who are aid recipients have got to get their act together in terms of uh, rule of law, corruption, um, good governance, etc. Uh, and there has to be that side of the partnership, which was always part of the G8's uh, mantra as well. So it's not just a, uh, a stick to with which to beat the rich countries. But there's undoubted there is that element, and uh, people will be looking to the rich countries to, develop on, um, to deliver on commitments they have made in the past. So I want to take questions from any of you. Just please introduce yourself before you ask a question. Dan. Thank you very much, very much Ambassador Grant, for the overview that you provided for us. And well, my name is Dan Irvin. I'm with the international health team based in Washington. And uh, the, the English government also for the investments in world vision in our health and local level advocacy programming, including the current grant that we have. The question that I have for you is, what is the significance, in your opinion, uh, of the MDGs, the current MDG framework, and the potential next generation MDG framework for the UK government foreign assistance plan and investments? So what, really, what is the impact government from this framework? Yeah, it's a, a good question. And I think for some countries, it probably doesn't play an operational role. Now, I'm not a development expert, and I don't have my development expert with me, so I don't want to mislead you on this. But my impression is that we have reorganized our overseas development around the MDGs. So it has become a 
operational policy tool for us. And that the assistance that we do is very largely based around the different MDGs. Not probably everything, but the vast majority of our aid is now based uh, around that. Now, it's based around a number of other things like women's development. Uh, we put women and children at the heart of the development too, but they're in the MDGs, so that's not sort of incompatible. But we do use it as an operational tool. I don't know how many other countries do, but we certainly do. Any questions? Thanks for that, that was extremely helpful. Uh, just a question on your view on the political likelihood, just to post Rio, on being able to even achieve and get consensus around um, a post-2015 agenda. Um, is, I, I'm after your impression, of does it, will it need to be something that's extremely high level and extremely symbolic to get an agreement in this sort of economic and political environment? This is Amanda from Australia. Oh, yeah, hello, Amanda. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, a, that's another good question. The, um, uh, I think it's most unlikely in reality that the intergovernmental process will deliver the product we need. Um, it didn't do so at Rio, it doesn't do so in the climate change negotiations, it doesn't do so in the Doha you know, development round. Uh, it's become, the, the mood music at the UN is not good at the moment. Um, there's a number of factors for that. Um, the economic financial crisis is obviously one. Uh, there's the whole sort of Libya responsibility to protect civilians intervention argument uh, is another. But the sort of north-south dynamic, uh, to put it very crudely, or it's a sort of G77, a group of countries in the G77 are pushing back against some of the normative developments there have been in recent years. So if you look in a strategic sense about what has happened at the UN over the last 20 years, there have been some extraordinary steps forward with the Human Rights Council, the establishment of UN women, responsibility to protect, the International Criminal Court. You know, there are massive advances in the areas of women, uh, human rights, LGBT rights, uh, democratic rights, if you like, accountability. And there's something of a pushback against that now, led by the Egypts and the Pakistans and the Irans and the Cubas and the Venezuelas and people like this supported by Russia and China and other sort of status quo powers. So what we're finding is in all these areas, we're increasingly in the trenches defending the gains we've made over the last 20 years, rather than being able to push forward. To give you an example, you know, the Beijing platform for women 20 years ago, there was a question of whether there should be a Beijing plus 20. We are going to try and avoid a Beijing plus 20 because it gives an opportunity for those who hated what happened in Beijing to roll back on that. Uh, you saw that on the commission of the status of women in, in March for the first year for many years there was no uh, agreement uh, on a report and that was a bit of an unholy alliance uh, literally uh, between the sort of Islamist leaning countries, the Holy See and the right-wing US NGOs uh, coming together to push back against sexual and reproductive rights, women's rights, etc. So, you know, that's an example that we're, we're fighting now uh, a sort of rising current of resistance to some of these issues. Now, all that uh, is by way of background, means that I think going through an intergovernmental process in the normal way, we'll be fighting in the trenches on, you know, references to occupied territories in the Middle East and, and uh, G20 not being properly representative and, you know, a mixture of countries who are fighting ideological battles of 20, 30 years ago, like the Alba group, together with the uh, uh, Islamic countries who are nervous about some of the progress on, on women's rights, 
Russia and China who are worried about democratic rights, rule of law, and human rights. So they all come together to make life very difficult. So uh, that's why I think at the end of the day, come September 2015, there's going to be have to be some sort of deus ex machina or something is going to have to come in rather like it did in 2000 and produce the one piece of paper and then get it blessed by heads of government who are much more tolerant and sort of less w willing to unpick <laughs> the detail than their officials. Uh, and I think what we hope is that the panel at that point will have produced a piece of paper around which people can, can rally um, and provide the input into that final analysis because I think otherwise it's going to be very, very difficult um, in 2015. Mel Melanie Gow, also from Australia. <coughs> Given the political um, climate that you've just explained, what, what do you think the realities are of um, primarily sticking with what we've got, MDGs, versus some version of an enhanced MDGs, potentially with some SDG goals, vis-a-vis -vis the GDG option that you've previously mentioned, given the political context that you've just explained, what do you think the most likely outcome from where you sit now would be? There's so much water that's going to flow under the bridge between now and then, I, I hesitate to make a, a, a judgment. I think, w I think we are going to need to bring together the MDGs and the SDGs. I think there is a recognition that the two are linked and, you know, sustainability is obviously important to development and development is essential for sustainability. Uh, so I think some form of, I mean, G I say GDGs, it may not end up anything like that, but it'll be, I think there'll be something that will, it'll bring it together. I think there is a desire uh, to bring it together and a logic behind bringing it together. I think the bigger question, in a sense, is how far beyond the MDGs you can go in, in other areas uh, that I mentioned, the, the key enablers in terms of growth, in terms of conflict, in terms of rule of law. Uh, in terms of corruption, mutual accountability. Uh, and there, there'll be quite a lot of resistance um, because people will be thinking that that is taking the focus off poverty. Uh, and I think that's wrong. I think if we set out a bold enough vision, and, and uh, you know, my personal view is we should be setting out a vision to not to reduce poverty, but to eliminate poverty, is the obvious next step. And, you know, we, we've talked in 15-year cycles, but there's absolutely nothing magical about 15 years. You know, we could make it 10 years, we could make it 20 years, we could make it 50 years, or whatever. Uh, uh, but I think you need to have a vision that you are going to get rid of poverty entirely. And, and people buy into that because it's bold and it's ambitious and it's obviously of ever, to everyone's benefit. But then digging beneath that, how do you get there? Do you go through the growth road? You know, how much do you emphasize growth? Uh, private investment, um, rule of law, good governance, uh, which conflict reduction. Uh, you know, these are key enablers from our point of view, but are ones that are not universally sort of accepted because people think we're taking the ball eye off the poverty ball by talking about it. Whereas we say you can't get poverty elimination without that. Just look at the statistics. So that I think will be the bigger challenge in a way than bringing together the SDGs uh, and the MDGs. We're in the back, actually. Before you go, I don't want to put you on the spot, but Jose or Leanna, if you have a question, we'd love to have you ask one if you want to. So, Karina first, and then. Yes, thank you. Uh, Corina Villacorta, I'm Peruvian, originally based in New York. My question is in relation to uh, one scenario in the post-2000, which is, is the increasing inequality. So I, I wonder if you see <coughs> that inequality provides an opportunity because it exists now in different countries, both uh, industrialized, developed, and developing and emerging economies, whether you see a potential platform for unity and agreement around inequality among the intergovernmental discussion. Yes, I think the inequality issue uh, is there. Um, I think one of the weaknesses in the MDGs is that they are global measurements. So, you know, you're trying to reduce by 50% people in absolute poverty. Well, uh, China takes 500 million people out of poverty, target met, <laughs> without actually having any impact in, say, India or Africa. 
uh, you have a situation where Brazil meets the target, but actually if you break down Brazil into districts, massive inequality. Um, and in a lot of the developing countries, you're seeing overall development, overall growth, overall reduction in poverty, but inequality growing absolutely staggeringly. Uh, and some of the most unequal countries in the world are now these emerging uh, economies. So how do you sort of tackle, tackle that? I think that is a, it is a challenge. It's recognized as an issue. Um, but I think you need to, one way of doing it is, is breaking down the measurements so they're not quite so global, not quite so regional, not quite so national, but you're breaking it down into slightly more subnational bodies uh, or areas. But that in itself is highly controversial uh, in most countries, uh, so it won't be easy. So I think people recognize it as a, as a problem. Uh, whether it can be tackled through the intergovernmental process, I think is very, very challenging because people are very sensitive about inequalities in their own country. <coughs> yeah. In the East, you can go among the possibility to young people to participate in MDG. Yeah, I think um, uh, we would certainly want to. Uh, the panel itself has some young people, although the definition of young at the UN is probably a bit different <laughs> from yours. Uh, but the hey, it's good to see you. Uh, but uh, there's certainly uh, people in their thirties. <laughs> put it that way in the panel. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's anyone under thirty. <laughs> but that counts as young when you get to my age. So. Um, uh, but the panel, of course, is just a panel. But yes, in terms of the outreach, I think there is the ability to bring in young people's views. Apart from anything else, they tend to be more technologically savvy and uh, have the ability to input through social media, etc., more than older people anyway. So I think there will be a lot of opportunities for young people to put in their, put in their two penny worth. And of course, given the global demographics involving young people, uh, is absolutely critical because you've only got to look at the Arab Spring and the biggest challenge of the Arab Spring is not what you read in the papers, it's, it's youth employment. Uh, even in the Eurozone now, youth employment has become an absolutely massive issue. Uh, so I, th I think we will need to uh, make sure that the outreach does allow that sort of views to come in. But, uh, but look at the panel, as I say, <laughs> people in their 30s anyway. So if we could just take one more question with sure. you and uh, running at the keyboard. I'm. It's ready in the hall. I'm Reni Jacob from India. It was great listening to you, especially the principle you said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, about the focus on MDG should not be lost. Uh, my question, probably some insights I would like to have, is on even today many countries are not reaching the target. There are three more years to go, but at the same time we are working on the next after 2015. Uh, do you think that we need some kind of new mechanism or approach to help <coughs> these countries also to reach the target at the same time we are working for the future? Otherwise we will be in a higher level working on the principles, but there will be a kind of a disconnect between what is happening at the top and what is happening in the field. Can you throw some light on how best some new approach or a mechanism how to how to see that this disconnect is not there? Yeah, thank you. I, it is a risk. Um, you know, you don't have to be at the UN for very long to know that people prefer talking about process uh, than they do about substance, and they prefer talking about process than they do about implementation. So that is a, a great challenge, uh, and people are getting very interested and excited about the process going forward and not so much about the substance or indeed about the implementation of what we've already agreed. Whether a new mechanism is required or useful, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think we have the mechanisms. We have a lot of lessons learned over the sort of first 12 years of the, of the MDGs. We know what works. We know which countries have applied policies and inputs which have made a difference and being able to reduce poverty in their countries. And we know 
why some countries have been unable to do it. And, and I mentioned the statistic about countries in conflict. Uh, but there are many others uh, too. So I think a lot has been learned. Um, it's a question of applying those lessons over the next three years for the countries that are still struggling. Um, and that's why uh, I mentioned we would be doing this MDG countdown uh, meeting uh, at UNGA, focusing very much on uh, what needs to happen over the next three years for the maximum number of countries uh, to meet the targets and for the maximum number of people to be lifted uh, out of poverty. And why we had the, the summit last month in London on the family planning, focusing specifically on uh, MDG as four and five, because those are the ones where the most gains could be made and so far haven't been made. Before Jose introduces himself, Liana was far too modest to mention this, but she's from, from Arnie Media and she's been serving on the Beyond 2015 UN Working Group as a youth representative, so very excited about that. And Jose wants to ask a question, so please introduce yourself before you do. Sou Sérgio. My name is Sérgio Sobrinho da Costa. É, moro no Rio de Janeiro. I live in Rio de Janeiro. Brasil. Brasil. É, trabalho como assistente de advocacy da Visão Mundial. I work as an advocacy assistant for the World Vision in Brazil. E acompanho o projeto de monitoramento de políticas públicas. And uh, I am part of the public monitoring uh, policies project. Que está em sete estados brasileiros. Which is in seven Brazilian states. E gostaria de saber se o Brasil está no caminho certo de alcançar o objetivo do milênio. I would like to know if you think Brazil is, is, is on its right way to meet its target on the millennium goals. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure I'm equipped to, or qualified to, to answer that, uh, that question. Um, but I, I think Brazil uh, does fit into that category of emerging economic and political power, where huge uh, strides have been made and growth has been made, but that inequalities have increased greatly. And there are pockets of extreme poverty which have not been tackled. And so it's one of those countries which, if you look at in a global national basis, has met most of the targets. But if you break it down, and if you look at a map of Brazil by district, um, practically the whole map is red. Whereas if you look at it on a global scale, Brazil is, comes out green. So uh, there are massive challenges still in Brazil, um, but I can't give you the sort of chapter and verse, I'm afraid, on, on exactly which targets they've missed and, and, and which are being met. Well, again, on behalf of World Vision, Professor Grant, we want to thank you again. Uh, I want to thank you for the fortitude of the UK government in protecting its ODA levels and moving toward 0.7. That's no small feat in this current economic climate. And just look forward to working with you as you continue to represent the UK government in a critical role. And I uh, hope we can be in dialogue on that in the future. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so we're doing a passing of the baton. <laughs> we're grateful that Ambassador Ojambo is with us. She's the Deputy Permanent Representative of Kenya to the United Nations. She also has a very, very impressive CV. I'll just mention that she has a broad-based experience over 23 years in international public health and community development and in policy advocacy planning and programming. Um, what I kind of mentioned at the outset of our time is that we've got 25 plus leaders from all across the World Vision Partnership. We've got two dynamic young people who you just heard from. We have uh, leaders at the national le level as well as international level from World Vision. And we're here for two days to try to figure out a strategy on how we best engage in the post millennium Development Goal framework and process and we're just anxious to hear some of your reflections about how the government of Kenya is looking at the post-MDGs and what you hope to see happen. You know, what, what is your ultimate hope for moving forward? 
Thank you very much. I didn't quite get my moderator's name. I want to hear oh. that first. Sorry, <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Adam Taylor. I'm the <laughs> Vice President for Advocacy of World Vision US. Thank you very much, Adam. And as you've heard, my names are Josephine Ojambo. I am the Ambassador and DPR at the Kenya Mission to the UN. It's actually a delight to be here this morning because uh, before joining Foreign Service, I worked in consultancy services in public health and community development. And in my engagement in Kenya, I actually had the opportunity to work with World Vision. I spent a little time doing an evaluation of a World Vision program just outside Nairobi in a place called Kahawa West. And what was very evident is that World Vision is very careful to look at the work it's doing in terms of selective primary health care along its agenda for transformative leadership or transformative development. And since you have that as part of your purview, the issue of transformation, I think that building on it, you'll be able to then very clearly and in fact very easily adopt the way forward in terms of 2015 as we shall discuss it here. So I just want to reiterate that there's a long-going friendship and I'm happy to therefore be present with uh, both national and international representation of World Vision. And maybe more, um, Kenya actually values World Vision's partnership at uh, community level in many settings, in humanitarian assistance and also in routine programming. And I'd like just to underscore that we commend you and we look forward to continuing this partnership indeed after 2015. Thank you. I have a few notes and I'll speak to them and uh, maybe we shall then in Q&A speak about specific issues that you feel you'd like me to underscore. Um, the 2015 agenda. This agenda really presents challenge, challenge to all member states and of course challenge to Kenya too. But more than that, increasing responsibility. And why? Because of the definition of what 2015 as a package will, will entail. Um, and with the challenge, of course, there's much expectation. Many are sitting, holding breath, and wondering, what is 2015 going to mean for each one of us? And so there's lots of expectation on member states. And in preparation towards that date, we are already obliged to begin planning. And we have had a number of sessions as ambassadors, and we're beginning to think in thematic groups around what 2015 will mean. But there are very many different world settings where 2015 as an agenda item or post-2015 will have to be applied. And so it's important for World Vision because you have an international agenda which has regional representation and national representation to look at the various world settings. And indeed, Kenya, the developing world, and in particular, Eastern Africa presents its own setting. And I know World Vision therefore will be mandated and challenged to actually bring and bring down the 2015 agenda downloaded to East Africa and to Kenya. As you might know, in September of last year, the United Nations Secretary General mandated a high-level panel to help him begin the conceptual thinking around 2015. And indeed, we have a concept note. So we're not just thinking anymore. We have a concept note which is widely known as the future we want. This future we want is a note that I think you all are aware has been discussed in the context of Rio. But even beyond 2015, oh sorry, beyond the concept note, the Secretary General also launched a specific panel comprising the President of Indonesia, the President of Liberia, and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I hope Mark spoke about this. And this panel is going to be his high level advocacy team a leadership team that's going to help him engage with presidents and leadership of governments around the world on the post-2015 agenda. For Africa, we're delighted to have Her Excellency Eileen Sirleaf as part of this team because she brings to us the central issues of women in the new agenda, governance in the new agenda, the role of inclusive development in the new agenda. And so for many of the programs in Africa, you will be interacting with Eileen Sirleaf as we download 2015 to program level. But what is the challenge? The challenge then is to describe an agenda that is bold because we're looking forward to a new rallying call. As we all know, the MDGs was a rallying call for the, U the UN system. So post 2015, 
must live up to the running call that we had through the MDGs. So it must be bold, but it must be practical. Because people don't want to have an agenda that will create too much buzz in terms of words without perhaps too much meaning. So we want practicality in the boldness of the agenda. It must also identify areas of consensus, because even though we've spoken of world settings that are different, and you're going to want to speak about Kenya, there must be consensus between Kenya and its neighbors on what are the primary goals for that world setting. But there must be an international consensus on what are the major goals that need to be attained in the post-2015 agenda. And if there's this consensus, we'll be able to shape a global partnership. And that's very important. The MDGs brought the global community together around a partnership that has outlasted many years indeed of concurrent, or should I say, coincidental events and priorities. That partnership has been sustained. There have been differences in the rate of implementation, but the word and the meaning of the MDGs was actually a global partnership. And we all know that the MDG 8 spoke about global partnerships. So the SDGs and the way forward after post-2015 must encompass a global partnership. But like I've heard Mark say, there will be some points of uh, departure and really, the central point of departure will be the attainment of the MDGs and the promises that were made, and have those promises been fulfilled. But the MDGs provide a building block for the 2015 agenda. Um, in step with the MDGs, now, the post-2015 agenda will focus on sustainable human development. And now this is an area where I know World Vision has its forte. As you recall, the MDGs talked of things such as education, health, the environment. Those are issues that really are at the core of human development. And indeed, the MDGs had as its rallying call poverty reduction. So the 2015 agenda will focus on building further the issues of sustainable development and poverty reduction. And like I've said, it will do that by addressing inclusive economic growth, demographics. So for those who are interested in the issues of population and migration, there will be an element on demographics. There will be the issues of equity, where equity at country level in Kenya will mean equity between central Kenya, perhaps, and western and coastal Kenya, because there are different social economic indicators. So we're talking about equity and also good governance. In fact, this upcoming session, the UN is going to consider the rule of law as part of an agenda of good governance. Indeed, post-2015 is going to look at the issues of good governance. And you've spoken about that with Mark. I've heard you speak about the Arab Spring. The issues of good governance will be central to 2015. What does that mean for Kenya? Kenya right now is fast forward on Vision 2030. So Vision 2030 will still remain a central planning document and a blueprint for the activities that will dovetail the MDGs in the post-2015. On demographics, Kenya is still looking at its high population growth, the concerns of youth, the concerns of migration, because we have populations that migrate often because of contexts that cause crisis and internal and external displacement in terms of refugee populations. We're also looking at the issues of equity in Kenya. Like we've said, we have differences in various uh, uh, regions. But then lastly, the issues of good governance. I think we're all aware that Kenya has recently promulgated a new constitution, and we are looking at how we can download this new constitution into legal frameworks that can be enforced. So good governance will definitely remain part of Kenya's agenda in step with 2015. But the 2015 agenda will therefore be founded on just three basic principles. A quality principle, a sustainability principle, and multi-sectoral engagement. I want to just pause there and say that 2015 provides an opportunity for early engagement with partners. As opposed to other planning processes, the 2015 process is calling on board partners in its initial stages. So I'd like to invite World Vision to begin to engage not just with the UN here, but even with member states, with Kenya, with its Ministry of Planning, early as a partner, because this will be a requirement of the 20, 
2015 going forward agenda. This new agenda is being crafted at a time when the whole world is facing the global financial and economic crisis. And what does that mean? It means that the donor basket will indeed be sh less. It means that priorities will be different. And so I'd like us to have that in mind, the cognizance of the fact that we have this global financial and economic crisis. But still, the promise of the MDGs, despite that crisis, will need to be attained. And you will hear countries and members from Africa and other developing world settings saying that it would be unfortunate to cut back on program funding agreed before 2015 because of the concurrent global and economic crisis. There will be a continued sustained appeal for securing funds at the levels that were committed so that those MDGs can be attained and as quickly as possible before we take off on the post-2015 agenda. Um, there will be need to address political and turf issues. Now these will relate to the global community but will spill over into settings such as Kenya within the developing world. Let me be a bit clear on that. We do know that currently Kenya has moved into what you'd call middle income as a member state. And we find ourselves represented within the G77 and China, where indeed there is an appeal now for greater emphasis in terms of social development. This is a different context from being a lower or least developed country where it apparently is easy to understand that there must be an emphasis on social development. Middle income countries tend to paint or portray a picture of being able to do a number of things on their own. But for those that are transiting from lower income to middle income, with the MDGs not yet attained, there will be need to address the agendas that exist within a G77 framework, but still, because there will be need to address the MDGs, look at some of those countries in context of the unattained MDGs. This will be a political question at the UN. It will require a lot of uh, member states' negotiations and lobbying, but even at country level, it will still remain a political issue if education is not sustained, if water is not provided, if in particular places health indicators are not attained, and we begin to talk about economic growth in terms of the middle income kind of image and leave behind the agenda of the promises that we were to fulfill. So there will be a lot of dynamics that will be political at country level, and they'll be tough. Tough wars about who should do what and when, and why haven't you completed my agenda. I'd just like you to be alive to that. Um, beyond that, the goals must be simple, clear, and concise, and they must be integrated in national development. So I go back again on that point and invite you to continue to work with the Ministry of Planning, as I know you do, but to now talk about the post-2015 with the same ministry. I want to therefore now address the SDGs. I made mention of them lightly, and I smile because they came out of my mouth before I meant them to come out. We've spoken at Rio Plus 20 about agreeing to establish SDGs, but they haven't yet been defined and established because the global community realizes with the MDGs on the backdrop, it would be foolhardy to rush into the SDGs, but we do realize they are an eventuality that will have to come. And the SDGs, we know, will address social, economic, and environmental matters. And um, it's important that we look at them and look at how we will implement them. And these SDGs will be part of the post-2015 agenda. They won't be the whole agenda, but they'll be part of the agenda. So it's important we begin to think about the scope of these SDGs. Now the thing about the SDGs is that at Rio, many member states, and Kenya amongst them, felt that there were commitments made before Rio that hadn't been lived up to. There were commitments that were left hanging in the balance. And so many member states, Kenya being one, are saying, these SDGs, we want real commitments now, real commitments from those governments that are able, able to help the rest of the world live up to attaining a green economy. We want them committed to the same. We want the institutional framework for sustainable development to be a commitment for all member states. This plays itself out in discussions that Kenya has been part of at Rio, which include UNEP as a discussion, and other issues of the green economy, and the institutional framework at large. I'm just saying that you hear Kenya and others call on member states that are able to commit themselves. We are saying we don't want to hear about the past, no pasts, 
the MDGs are not passed. We don't want to hear, that's interesting. We want real commitment. We want people to say, it's an interesting discussion. Commit yourself to the SDGs on the issues that are social and economic and environmental. Not a conceptual discussion, but something for countries to commit themselves to. Um, we also want to ensure that we have focal representation from all continents. I've mentioned the fact that the SG has put in place a panel where we have the president of Liberia. We'd like to ensure that the six continents of the globe are also involved, because then we have larger room to continue advocating. We also want to ensure, and we will, that the UN special agencies in total and the initiatives of the UN are involved in post-2015. What does this mean? It means that UNICEF should be brought on board. You need to begin advocating with UNICEF. WHO would be on board. UNDP would be on board. And they would also articulate a 2015 agenda at country level. So it means new programming cycles at country level. And the invitation, therefore, for World Vision to engage with these UN partners at country level in new program definition. But also the Secretariat at the UN. DESA will be on board. UNODA will be on board. The offices that underscore issues of landlocked and least developing nations will be on board. The special representative for Africa will be on board. So you need to be visiting these offices so that you can define the agenda, not only for Africa, but even for Kenya from those offices. And then initiatives of the UN, such as financing for development, will need to address financing in the 2015 agenda. And then you need to look at what does this resolution on financing for development mean in terms of Kenya. The 2015 agenda, it must be innovative. We don't want to do what we did before. If it wasn't working, we must be innovative. We will draw on public sector financing, but we'll draw heavily on private sector and community involvement. These are partners that World Vision will want to bring on board, even in Kenya. There will be the need to address debt sustainability in order that where there are clawbacks because of the global financial crisis, we're able to talk into the future, understanding the issues of economics. But given all this as a scenario, we want to underscore accountability. Accountability from government, from those partners and departments in government that you work with, and accountability from the donors and the UN. If all these are put together, we're sure we'll have an effective post-2015. Thank you. Those are just a few words, and I hope I've been able to stimulate your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great overview. Um, we have about 15 minutes to, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Do you have time? All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Sure. The, the ambassador of uh, Mexico was also scheduled to join the panel, um, but his uh, foreign minister arrived in town yesterday because uh, uh, he's presenting a, a briefing on G20 at the plenary this afternoon, but he has sent us uh, his delegates. Um, if we have any questions regarding G20, regarding the second committee, which is the committee where a lot of all of these discussions uh, start, um, he's here to also respond to that question. So if you have any, just ask him. So please, join us up here, if you would. <laughs> and if, if you just wouldn't mind introducing yourself very quickly, and then we'll just turn it over for some questions. Sure. My, my name is Eduardo de la Torre. I, I work at the, at the Mission of Mexico. And uh, as Arelis mentioned, uh, my, my ambassador is actually yeah, hosting our, it's actually our deputy pr uh, foreign minister, who's the Sherpa for the G20, who's going to brief the, the uh, member states at uh, 3.30. So I also encourage you to, to go. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Great. Some questions. Yes, Michael. Yeah, my name is Michael Lumo. I'm a Ghanaian, but work in uh, World Vision as Regional Advisor on Advocacy based in Dakar. My question is, uh, what do you think African leaders, what, what different attitudes should African leaders adopt this time towards the post-MDG processes and its implementation? And what is your sense of the role of regional bodies in ensuring that accountability is uh, 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 fulfilled in this in this business. 
Thank you very much. A very substantive question. Um, the challenge for African leaders. We've spoken about accountability in the last part of my little uh, overview, and you've also echoed the same. Really, there will be lots of accountability on the leadership of Africa in terms of attaining the goals. And accountability has with it an inbuilt sense of responsibility for the things you ought to do. And so the first call will be on the leadership of Africa itself to make the first strides towards the post-2015 agenda. And not say it's an agenda that we wait for from without, but really it's our agenda. And in order that it becomes our agenda, and the African leadership takes it as their agenda for Africa, there will be need, like I've said, for early engagement with stakeholders from within the African continent. So the leadership will have to begin to engage, and engage not just within the public, but also beyond public to private sector and its own communities. But this is possible within the summit that we bring together as the Africa Union in the first instance. And that summit with its regional or sub-regional representation should then now delegate the process to the sub-regional groups so that we would have ECOWAS, we would have IGAD and East African Group, the Central African Group, the Northern Africa Group, and SADAC. And with them, the regional representation thereof of the UN, I'm you know, moving a little bit, the, the UN within those regions too, and the RCs within those regions to partner with the regional representation of the leadership of Africa. The issues for Africa are not strange. They are the issues that we all know of younger populations the need to address the youth bulge, the need to address the issues of unemployment, but then also the need to address beyond that democratic governance and, in fact, the transformation that we're seeing in leadership across Africa. Other issues that there will be need for are those that will address the concerns of women and, indeed, the sustainability of the environment and sustainable development. I think we need to continue to ask our leaders to address the need to have population policy in place that is cognizant of consumption and production, but also looks at the green economy as an area for continued employment of its young. The green economy can actually create jobs, and we need to look at how we can utilize that. I'm saying this, and this is going to be part of the hard pill that they will have to swallow, when we're still looking at coal-driven economies and fossil-driven economies, the fact that the green economy is still potential for us and potential for the young people of Africa. Beyond that, we need to look very clearly at the issues of conflict because conflict does put a spanner in the works for social development. So you will be drawn on in humanitarian situations to look at arbitration and mediation of conflict because more and more, the responsibility for resolving conflict in Africa has become the responsibility of Africa and of the regional groupings within Africa. We do appreciate the role of the UN and the Security Council, but local initiatives must be brought to bear. So again, I think this is a place where World Vision, with its skills in managing community process, will not only be an early warning partner, you know, giving us detail on early warning, but also help us to mitigate against conflict at community setting. Those, I think, will be the agenda for the African leadership in 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Fernanda. Is there a mic somewhere? Yeah. All right. I want to thank you both for being here. And just to put it really plainly, uh, about speaking for the MDGs and the SDGs, let's put it that way. If I understand it correctly, the SDG could be the framework, the, the big legal framework, for an, an institutional framework. And the MDGs could be the goals and the indicators. So in that sense, if we have two discussions on a higher level, and then we have the, the discussion on the national office, more in terms of the goals that could be more achievable. Which are we, from the, your different countries, the perspective of how the, the national level and can partnership with um, NG NGOs in terms of getting more, getting more strength in the terms of social development against the tension with conflict? 
how we can partnerships in terms to, to, to get that importance of the MDGs to get stronger in, in a situation when we have the economic crisis and, and all these challenges together. In terms of the, the process, I, I don't think it is quite defined yet what, what the, the, pro the, the, the way to make them converge will be and which will be the, the, um, the, comprehensive, the more comprehensive of the two. There are still some options saying, uh, as, as Ambassador Grant said, maybe they will converge and become global development goals at some point, or maybe the SDGs will be more comprehensive because they, they they speak about a development across cutting areas, more broad, that will comprise and give continuity to the MDGs. But again, it, it is a charged issue to, to give them um, a name which will be the successor of, of, of which. But we, we do believe that the, the SDGs or, or the successor mechanism has to be broad, more representative, definitely more, more cross-cutting and universal than it has been uh, now and comprise even not only uh, sustainable because sustainable has been equated with environmental which we think is, is a mistake and it has to be sustainable in, in economic terms in social terms but also be broader and comprise human rights issues and conflict based at the same time try to be as, as specific as possible as, as Ambassador Jambo mentioned to, to uh, be able to respond to national realities and I, I do think also that um, we, we think uh, they should, um, as, as they are an intergovernmental process uh, eventually, either both in the design and the approval and the implementation, but also take into, into account and, and uh, um, draw upon all the, the experiences and the expertise of experts from the countries, from the regions, and from the UN system, including um, from the UN uh, development group, but also broader, even the, S the, the, the successor to the, to the MDGs and the, and the SDG and the potential to converge to SDG. It also has the potential to correct some um, of the problems that are, are found now at the, with the resident coordinators, for example, that there is this uh, complaint that uh, it's based only on one um, or, or only, only one um, or, or a few uh, agencies are involved, so definitely the, the, the regional commissions have to be there, the, and, and other agencies, UNICEF, definitely the World Food, Food Program, and even the human rights, and, and so on. So. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? Okay. Okay. I actually have a question for each of you. <laughs> One is, I'm just curious what role you think the African Union will be playing. You mentioned some of the regional bodies across Sub-Saharan Africa, but curious if there's a particular role for the AU. And in light of the speech this afternoon, I'm wondering whether you see a convergence between some of the G20 development agenda and this post-MDG conversation and process. I know that the Mexico government's going to be hosting a development working group meeting in Indonesia in the fall. And I'm wondering if you see some opportunities there. Thank you very much. Um, the Africa Union. The Africa Union continues to play a leadership role. Um, we have just recently celebrated the election of Dr. Zuma as our commissioner. And uh, this is a, a landmark, a, a very, very much a momentous election, because we now have uh, the first lady heading <laughs> the Africa Union. I'm saying that because. <laughs> She brings a wealth of skill, a wealth of skill in health, in urban planning, in foreign policy. So she will shape the character of the Africa Union on the way f forward, perhaps towards social development within urban contexts, but also be very strong with foreign policy. I just want to, first of all, say that as a highlight in terms of the way forward, which are useful tenants for the discussion in 2015, post-2015. But beyond that, the AU serves as the interface of the African continent with the international world and community. And indeed, the AU has a role at the UN, 
first of all, a role in particular on the issues of conflict, which we've mentioned, at uh, the level of the Security Council. The AU has an interface there. So the AU will be the bringer of the message of Africa to the Security Council, and indeed take back decisions from the Security Council to Africa. The AU is represented by the Africa Group here in New York, and the member states, the ambassadors and the experts get together there often in configurations that are committee-based to discuss issues including the post-2015 agenda. So that will continue to exist, and this is um, a mandate that has been given the ambassadors here in New York by the Africa Union headquarters in Addis. So we continue to brief from here to Addis. But in Addis, the AU has a commissioner for social development. And I can see the issues of post-2015 falling squarely within this commission for social development. We've had a commissioner who has recently moved to a new setting and we're having an incoming commissioner. So the incoming commissioner will be charged with this new mandate, a new job with a new mandate. Then beyond that, the AU's role will be to continue building the capacity of the regional organizations. So the AU will be transmitting policy and training and developing the capacity of the leaders in ECOWAS, in SADAC, in Central Africa, in Northern Africa, and in Eastern Africa. The AU doesn't necessarily intervene. So priorities that are given at regional level will remain regional priorities. And if clear enough, articulated well enough, the AU will respect those, even when at times they need not necessarily be the same in terms of prioritization to those that would be Africa-wide or even maybe from the international community relayed through the AU. Now I'll speak to that a little more. Very recently within IGAD, we had an issue around Eritrea. And beyond Eritrea, the transnational trafficking of small arms and light weapons conflict, the internally displaced, and social development. And the member states felt that they wanted to bring this discussion to the Security Council. And because it was so pressing, it was done in direct relationship with the Security Council, in a manner of speaking, not undermining the AU, but even before the AU got on board, the region had brought its matter to the Security Council. The AU, therefore, realizing that the IGAD region was feeling very perturbed later came in and supported the resolution that came out of that Security Council discussion. So what I'm saying is that the AU's role is to build capacity. And if that capacity has been so well built that a regional body is able to undertake its own priorities, the AU's mandate, therefore, is to support that regional entity and support the transnational issues within that region. So if the AU also plays a very, um, it's a, a stewardship role, but a role that respects the local stakeholders and their prioritization. That would be the way forward. So we expect to have lots of planning processes that are sub-regional, pan-African, and the AU to be our interface with the international community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to make a, a, a position. We, uh, our ambassador has said this in, in a number of occasions, also uh, our, our government at large. Um, these processes, like the G20 and others, um, are both a symptom and an opportunity. They're, they are a reflection of a certain impasse we are at, at the UN, right? that we have a, a crisis of effectiveness and legitimacy and so on, which we are trying to address as much as possible. For example, at ECOSOC, we have uh, tried to, to bring forward these resolutions to reform the ECOSOC and, and begin this crosstalk also with the General Assembly and make it more effective, the working methods and so on, so that the, the UN continues and, and is, is strengthened even more uh, in dealing with, the, with, uh, uh, with development. So the, the development pillar is actually strengthened and made more dynamic and able to respond to realities. In the meantime, we also have engaged in these other processes because we have to respond to the current reality and we have taken them as, as an opportunity, but not as they are. We have tried to modify them as well. So in that respect, we try to make this uh, crosstalk between, for example, processes like Rio plus 20 and the G20 and bring the issues from Rio to the G20 and try to give continuity, for example, from the French presidency, which was uh, last year, 
into into here give continuity for example to inclusive green growth and employment and so on and not and try to expand it from its purely financial scope and and I, I think uh, it was very very successful because there were these debates and these discussions at the G20 in, in Los in Los Cabos and then we went to Rio and we brought the message from the G20 group and so on. So um, we, we are hoping, we, we have uh, called upon the, the Russian presidency to continue doing that and at the same time trying to revi revitalize and reform the UN so that these processes can coexist and not at any rate replace uh, one another and, and keep the, the, the crosstalk. Um, in that respect, um, we think that the, in, in the SDGs has to be, have to be as inclusive as possible and, have to, and, and be able to engage all these contribu contributions from these processes and, uh, and from civil society for sure. And, and so on. Well, thank you. I, I really want to thank both of you for taking up some time with us. I know your time is precious and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. We will look forward to working with both your governments in the way forward and hope that you can see World Vision as a key resource and ally in the process of developing the strong, strongest framework possible and particularly one that's going to have the most relevance for the world's most vulnerable people, including children. So thank you again. Muchas gracias. Santisana. <laughs> and we look forward to working with you.